what would you do if you were considered a mystical by the regular, regular scientist or also a very rational scientific person for the mystics? How can you be with this kind of dichotomy? And uh, is transcendence a subject of science? Can science study transcendence? So in my case, this started many years ago. When I was a child, I was a person very interested in science and technology. I always wanted to be a real scientist when I grew up. So when I was still very young, I was known and considered to be the mad scientist of my group of friends and of my neighborhood. So among many things I did, I caused some explosions at home. I caused short circuits. I had a kind of a spider farm. I caused even some Frankenstein mutations in some of my mother's plants, to the delight of my friends and to my mother's horror, as you can imagine. But at the same time, in parallel with that, I start having what is nowadays called out-of-body experiences or astral projections. So I start having this without any kind of previous knowledge. It was spontaneous. At the same time, and because of these experiences, I start feeling what nowadays we call bioenergy. And with this, this expanded my horizon. I started perceiving, experiencing many things beyond the normal day-to-day -day life. So as you can imagine, I started trying to get as much information as possible about this. And I discovered that this wasn't new. Many people knew about this. So I discovered popular authors, scholars, masters, many people studying this. And here you have some of those names. So I learned about Robert Kruko, about Reich is studying bioenergy, and Carrington, Muldoon, and also I learned that many other areas like theosophy, acupuncture, like yoga, and many other areas were studying the same thing. But I noticed that these areas, they still lacked a kind of a very regular, strict, systemized uh, study of uh, scientific study of uh, energy and all of these things. So we're studying this even more. I noticed that this concept of bioenergy is very universal across our history, in many parts of the globe, be it in the Eastern tradition or the Western tradition. But many times, people wouldn't be able to prove this was a reality. So I always thought, look, perhaps I can be a person that is able to project, leave the body and feel energy, but also trying to be a scientist I had the dream of one day becoming a researcher of this. So trying to prove, to bring evidences that there is a kind of a subtle life, a kind of subtle side of the reality. So we study more. I discovered more and more that people, many people were sensitive to this kind of energy. This energy was many times felt as a kind of electricity, vibration, a power, a flow that people can bring in can transmit, and sometimes it can even feel spontaneous or provoke a kind of a very strong vibration inside of them. So probably you already know about this concept, but under other names like vital energy or life force, chi or ki, prana, organ, ma animal magnetism. So then I thought, well, if we want, if I want to study this, let me try to see if I can detect, measure this. So I planned to devise or to create instruments that would be able to detect this. So at that time when I was still working as an engineer, I took advantage of the main resources I had available, and then I tried a Geiger counter, I tried a magnetometer, I tried some different kind of semiconductor um, sensors, but I had no results. And then I thought, well, let me try to come back and then review this whole thing. And then I thought about life. We are already the transducers, the transformers of this energy. Life is already, perhaps, the greatest expression of this life force. So I thought of using life as an inspiration for those detectors, for those meters. But certainly, because of ethics, I didn't want to use any kind of a living being, putting, you know, electrodes in an animal, anything like this. And also because with life being so dynamic, we wouldn't be able to rely, to trust those measurements because life is too, too dynamic. But then I thought, well, perhaps I could use some organic substances. And I picked proteins for that. Why? 
Because proteins are so central in all the process of life. Proteins are very complex, they are very mutable, they are so dynamic in their reactions. So then, at that time, I created a transducer of, made of a collagen gel. Collagen is a kind of protein very typical, very abundant in us. And I tried to measure the electrical resistance of that gel under the influence of a transmission of energy or not. And I got very interesting results there. But this was 1983, many years ago. And then I had to stop that for a while because of all, a lot of other commitments I had to assume. But during this whole period, why I had to stop for that for a while, I studied, tried to be as updated, informed as possible about science. And there was something very interesting that came to be known as the nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. So I was trying with this system to see if we could exactly answer these very important questions. First of all, is this form of life force, bioenergy, real? Can we detect it? Can we measure it, perhaps even giving it a unit, a scale, like we measure so many things in our life, like, for instance, volts, for instance? And perhaps, even more important, is it possible to develop a theoretical framework, a theoretical structure that could explain, predict, contextualize, generalize this kind of knowledge? So, to try to answer some of these questions, I was studying the magnetic resonance that basically take pictures, images of the interior of our body. But there is a specific variation of this technique that is the functional MRI. That means it shows the magnetic resonance image while the body is functioning. And usually this is used to show the brain and is used in medicine for diagnostic, but mainly for research. How is the brain when the person meditates? How is the brain when the person has some specific emotions? And here, as an example, I try to bring three very simple things. Look at the brain of one particular person when a person is speaking, like me here right now. When the person is moving the fingers, touching the tip of the fingers, and when the person is listening. You can see when a person is just paying attention, listening, there is less mental processing or brain processing than speech. And more than just illustrating what the bold technique function MRI can show, I, here I show this to you because we are going to use this as a comparison later. Try to see how much of the brain is used, kind of little, when we are speaking, when we are listening. So then what I thought, well, what if I get inside of this machine or if I put someone there and I ask the person to absorb energy from the external environment, to transmit energy, or even more, if the person can provoke what is called a vibrational state. Vibrational state is a kind of a very strong intensification of our energies. And because this a spontaneous vibrational state or provoked by vibrational state intensify our life energy field, I thought it would be much easier for me to detect it. And another thing, another advantage of this is that the vibrational state can be produced, provoked by anyone who learn a standardized technique that here it is just moving our energy inside of our body, is loaded at the beginning, accelerating until we create that. But what I wanted to do with that, first of all, to detect energy, to see which areas of the brain would be activated by that, but mostly, and for me this is the most important thing, is to understand something even more important, that is, what can we bring, how the consciousness controls the body. So here you see, when I got inside of one of these machines, trying to understand how the consciousness, something beyond the matter, space, energy, time, can control the physical brain. When I got the vibrational state, you can see here how much activation I got inside of my brain. A lot more than with the previous normal tasks we have every day. And something caught my attention. The appearance of some images outside of the head. This could not happen, should not happen. Well, if this is something that is affecting the air, changing some of the quantum characteristics of the air, in this case the so-called spin, this would be something so big, like a physical evidence, objective proof, 
that consciousness can control matter at distance without touching. So then I tried to go deeper on that, knowing how important this would be. Even more here, in this case, what I tried to do was to transmit energy, to send energies out, irradiating from my head. Can you see here how much image is out of the head? If the technique is applied there to detect the change of the level of oxygen in the blood, there is no blood in the air out of the head, was, what was this picking? But then I thought, well, the claim here is too serious, it's too big. What can I do to do to try to understand this even more? So I thought of using a simple thing, what is called a phantom, that is used in functional MRI as a calibration for the machine. It's basically a bottle with water with some chemical substances, very simple ones there. You put in the machine, it's not alive, you adjust the machine to have just a simple gray image there. So, I assumed this setup here, you can see me, this is me, lying down there, the bottle inside of the coil, the head coil, and my hands out. So this got inside of the machine, and then I was having there, in another room, an assistant telling me when to send energy, when to stop. And then you're going to see some interesting results here. This is the image before I tried to, say, to send any energy. And we confirm, nothing. But the moment I send energies there, look what happens. So we start perceiving or noticing the machine peaks a lot of activity, the so-called bold signal, inside of the water. And again, this cannot be. You can imagine, I showed this to many different radiologists and physicists. Most of them get very spooked by it. And then I thought of something even better than this. So last time, because I did this in 2009, 2010, but December 2014, I got the idea of using an egg, unfertilized egg, chicken egg, and put inside of the machine like it was before, in, in place, instead of the bottle of water, instead of the phantom. But instead of having my hands at the side, I came to be farther from that. And what happens, you are going to see there, this is a video, not a static image, you're going to see, because I had to shorten the whole time, because this is a very short time we are having here. So you're going to see the gray image. Perhaps you're going to hear my friend when he tells me to start. So could Alexander please help me with that? Look, can you see the structure of the egg, even the embryo there? Inicia. The yolk? Inicia. So we start. My friend tells me to start. There is nothing here. A few seconds later, that is compatible with the normal behavior of the function MRI. It takes a little while for the calculations. Can you see here, this image is appearing? He's going to bring this much closer. You can hear, hear my friend celebrating the results because after so many hours there. So this gets stronger and stronger. What is interesting here also is that the bold signal reveals a kind of a structure inside, for instance, of the yolk that we could not see before. Perhaps this indicates the presence of some specific proteins that in my case can be very interesting because it could be the inspiration for type of proteins that are more sensitive to energy. So I could develop some of those transducers I was describing later. After a while, after reaching the maximum, following the protocol, my friend tells me to para. stop. Para. I don't know if you heard. Para. So then I stop sending energy without moving, without doing anything, and then, you see, things start disappearing. After four, six seconds, look, it disappeared. So I ask you, is this proof already that this energy is real? Would this convince any researcher, mostly the skepticals? What do you think? I don't think we are quite there. So my claim is that this is not yet the final proof, but these are very interesting uh, results that should be taken into consideration. But you know, proof is something very complicated because there is no definitive proof. If proof ever exists, even some philosophers say the only thing we can do is to disprove something. But anyway, what I think, one of my points in this, uh, uh, speech here is to see if we can motivate other people, other researchers, to replicate, to repeat this, because if they get 
the same results are very similar ones, if many people can confirm this, then yes, we have a less relative proof. We would have more acceptance. But then this would be something big. Because as I said, this would be a new field in physics, a new field in science in general, a new field for the science of consciousness, a multidimensional consciousness, not consciousness as a byproduct of the brain, but perhaps the brain as a byproduct of the consciousness. So the thing is, if we prove, if we understand this, we can think, and this is one of my points as a person from technology, can we develop a technology of bioenergy, a bioenergy technology, as we had developed and used the mechanical, the thermodynamic, electrical, optical, electronic information um, technologies. So this would create so many different things. Imagine, for instance, if we could convert bioenergy into electricity, the same way this does with the sound into electricity. We could develop energy meters to evaluate people, even for their health, check the energies of our environment, produce images of the body internally, even of our energy fields. We could, for instance, perhaps forecast weather in a better way. We perhaps could develop some telescopes, cameras, able to take pictures of the still invisible realities of the cosmos, detect other dimensions. Imagine if we could use a system like this to prove someone can have a projection, leaving the body, go into another room and return. Imagine the impact that this would be like proving in a reliable, repeatable way that this can happen. And another way that I think is even more interesting, if we can convert electricity into bioenergy, another kind of transducer. But the point, and then I will finish with this, even being a person of technology, I think the biggest gain wouldn't be in technology, comfort, convenience, but is more in the philosophical area. Why? Because if we understand bioenergy, the bridge between consciousness and the world, we could, for instance, understand better our position in nature. Uh, what is the holistic structure or foundation of reality? We could comprehend ourselves much better. This would change everything. We would get, in my opinion, a different kind of worldview. We could get a different level of maturity of the consciousness. We could, for instance, get a much deeper level of personal principles. Our collective ethics would be much better as we see and can deduct, deduce from, for instance, the near-death experiences. The way I see, this could start, catalyze like a golden era, golden age of the human being. This would change everything. So, my point here is, can you do something about it? Can you be a person part of this, would you like to be part of this next leap in our evolution? Because this can be a bridge between the materialistic science and the science of transcendence, a science of the multidimensional consciousness. And I think everyone can be part of this. Thank you very much for your time.